Earth faster than man has ever traveled before. It's likely that car racing began not long after the invention of the wheel. Racing to come first, to finish ahead of the rest, is more than a sport. It's almost a primitive imperative in modern society. Racing for the love of racing, not because you're in a hurry or you're running away from something or chasing someone. It's just for the love of finishing ahead of another human being or of beating the clock. Before the motor car, we were already racing, on foot, on horseback, or with a bicycle, and then with a motorbike and a car, long before anyone had thought up Formula One. Then, just over 70 years ago, Formula One came into being, pushing things to the limit. Now it wasn't just about beating someone on track. The race started back home, back in the workshop. It was the race to come up with the design and manufacture of a quick car that was also reliable, drivable, and could be improved on. Like Mayflies only have a short life, these cars are replaced after each season, after having written their part in the history of the sport. That's what life is like at Scuderia Alfa Tauri. Along with the other teams, it adopts a whatever-it-takes approach to the most famous form of motor racing in the world, the Formula One, World Championship. The last 20 years, phew, Formula One has changed a lot. You know, in Formula One, you must be flexible. You must be open to changes. And I personally like changes. I like regulation changes. I like if we get new racetracks. I like to work together with new drivers because this makes your work interesting. Currently I would say that uh, Formula One is in the best shape of its history. Because if you come to the Grand Prix nowadays, the grandstands are full, the number of fans, especially of the younger generation is increasing dramatically and uh, I think this is very, very positive for Formula One. Formula One has seen so many changes, both great and small, over the years. Many of them have been due to regulation changes and new technologies introduced on the cars. The personality of so many drivers has also played its part over the years. But 30 years ago, when three teams, Ferrari, McLaren and Williams, had pretty much dominated the sport, someone arrived on the scene and really threw a spanner into the works of the world of racing. Austria's Dietrich Mateschitz brought the colour and energy of Red Bull to the circus. The energy drink brand gave birth to a well-defined project in the mid-2000s, with the acquisition by Mateschitz of first the English Jaguar Formula One team based in Milton Keynes and then the small Italian Minardi Formula One team from Faenza. You know, Dietrich Mateschitz was a unique and exceptional person. I am really very thankful that I could work together so many years with him and uh, Formula One owes a lot to Dietrich Mateschitz. First of all, he had two teams in Formula One. Second, he brought back the Grand Prix to Austria. Without Mateschitz and Red Bull, we would not have a Grand Prix in Austria. And for third, we must not forget in 2020, during the COVID pandemia, it was Mateschitz who opened the season for Formula One. 
Otherwise, maybe we wouldn't have had a race. Matešić said, we come to Austria, we will race there. And then the other organizers saw how he did it. And nevertheless, we managed to start the Formula One and therefore uh, we could save the 2020 season. And uh, if you see all these points together, I must say that uh, a big thank you to Dietrich Mateschitz. I am in Formula One now since uh, many years. And at the beginning, to be honest, I was a little bit shocked because there were two old buildings, 85 employees, and uh, I had to get an overview about everything. But I must say the most important thing was that uh, all the employees were very Formula One enthusiastic, very positive. And then uh, we were sitting together, discussing next steps, how we can do it in the best possible way. And this is how we started. Sono arrivato in Scuderia Toro Rosso 13 anni fa. Era gennaio del 2010, ero da poco uscito da Ferrari e squilla il telefono. Dall'altro capo del telefono c'è l'ingegner Giorgio Scanelli, direttore tecnico di Scuderia Toro Rosso. Avevamo lavorato insieme, sia in Ferrari che in Maserati Corse, in un progetto con un'ambizione simile a quella di Scuderia Toro Rosso. Risponde al telefono e Giorgio con la sua proverbiale eh, come dire, nonchalance mi disse testualmente non mi rompere i coglioni adesso tu prendi la macchina vieni a Faenza e vieni a fare un colloquio con Franz Tost We had to reshuffle the team we had to build up an infrastructure because there was nearly nothing some old machines and uh, this worked uh, well uh, thanks uh, to the good job of the people which uh, they did in those days and step by step uh, we improved everything. Quando sono entrato nel team è stato un po' come entrare in una, in una start-up. Il mio ufficio era fatto da me e da un'altra persona con relativamente poca esperienza. Eh, ci siamo dovuti e mi sono dovuto rimboccare le maniche in maniera molto forte ed è stata molto come una missione personale. Quello che era Scuderia Toro Rosso all'epoca mi ha spinto a diventare eh, un commesso viaggiatore, il commerciale del team eh, mettere tante ore dentro le attività e dimenticarmi i giorni della settimana. Avevo un fantastico zainetto con dentro costantemente con me una presentazione della scuderia con la quale cercavo di vendere quello che era il sogno e il progetto della scuderia. Qualcosa che non esisteva, non avevamo gli uffici, non avevamo le infrastrutture, non avevamo gli strumenti, non avevamo nemmeno tutte le persone che ci servivano per poter essere competitivi, ma avevamo la visione, avevamo il sogno di dove volevamo andare, a cui ognuno di noi in quel momento poteva dare un contributo personale molto forte. Sono in questa azienda da oltre 15 anni, la fase di crescita in questo team intanto è stata sia crescita diciamo, del, del team come dimensione, sia come crescita dell'identità del team, sia come crescita professionale e personale da parte mia. In 15 anni siamo cresciuti abbastanza, abbastanza insieme. Ogni giorno c'è qualche cosa di diverso, una evoluzione costante, delle procedure diverse, una tecnologia che arriva, che arriva nuova, noi stessi che cambiamo e impariamo ogni giorno qualcosa in più, quindi è molto importante che tutte le persone, eh, io stesso in primis, eh, continuiamo ad evolverci piano piano, eh, continuiamo a crescere, non solo come numero, ma anche sicuramente come, come performance e come competitività. The 2019 was a great season for Scuderia Toro Rosso. 
and it was also its last, as the following year it was reborn as Scuderia Alfa Tauri. The team's identity remained the same, but in February 2020, it changed its name and its look. It was the start of a new era with Alfa Tauri, Red Bull's premium fashion brand, which combines design and premium materials with technical innovation in the field of textiles. It joined forces with the Faenza team and with Formula One as the perfect platform to combine fashion and function. Il fatto di avere come missione la crescita, la formazione, lo sviluppo di giovani piloti senza esperienza sicuramente è una sfida molto molto importante che ha tanti aspetti positivi e tanti angoli complicati. Penso che rappresenti uno degli ingredienti che rende Scuderia Alfa Tauri molto più interessante di altre scuderie. La sfida che abbiamo di fronte noi, che la rende più complessa ma anche più eccitante è quella di poter competere con il nostro gruppo di competitor diretti, quindi con Aston Martin piuttosto che con Alpine, con Alfa Romeo, con Haas, avendo la sfida di fare una vettura competitiva ma avendo la sfida anche di mettere in macchina piloti giovani. It was a, a challenge for the complete team, you know, not, not only for me, also for the engineers because Uh, especially the engineers are working very close together with the driver, data engineer, race engineer and uh, if you have an unexperienced young driver the workload is uh, much bigger and um, it was a very interesting uh, period to work together with all these young drivers because every driver has his own character, his own personality and then to see how they grow up and uh, to educate them uh, was a real good and I must say interesting time for all of us and I wouldn't like to miss it. If I have to explain about Skills of Atari, I would say first of all it's really friendly team. It's just like you know just when you when you be in the classroom in junior high school or high school all people seems like a classmates, you know, just chatting each other and helping each other um, to, to achieve the same goals or anything. I mean, I think at the end of the day that your driver is a key link in the feedback process. We, you know, we have an awful lot of data and a lot of clever people looking at this data and, and trying to develop the car from it, but the driver feedback is a, is a very key part because they can tell you things that you don't immediately see in the data, which can give you a pointer towards something which might not stand out as an engineer. Um, also, each driver is different, so you can have theoretically, you know, what you consider to be the best car, but if the driver is not able to drive it or is not comfortable with it, you're leaving performance on the table. So it's, it's very important as a technical director to make sure the drivers are being listened to and that you keep the drivers in the loop about what you're doing and that they can have input and awareness about where you're going with car development. You know, it's an iterative process. Engineers are constantly looking for more performance and the drivers are constantly learning about the car and evolving their thought processes and what they think um, is a strength or weakness of a car and also what they see when they're following and racing with other competitors. So, you know, they're a key part of the process of trying to develop a Formula One car. Ten stars and personaggio. <laughs> We can say it like this. He's, uh... He's a unique character. He's boss, of course, but I'm thinking like more to like kind of feature, like professor, whatever. <laughs> First of all, both of them are very high skilled drivers. Pierre is much more experienced than Yuki. From the personal side, Pierre is a driver who steps up step by step. Yuki is a driver who is risking a lot immediately. From this side, They are different. He's not an easy person to understand. He's quite unique in his way of working and communicating. But once you understand him properly, then you realize how much he cares about everything. It's all about the team, the performance, and the result that we get in the end. 
And um, I must say now after, you know, we've been working with friends for the last five years. It's a very strong relationship. You know, when Pierre went to Red Bull Racing, it was simply too early. And then, fortunately, Red Bull decided to bring him back to us. And I remember when he came back to us, uh, he visited us here, and I said, hey, it looked like you were here yesterday. Yeah, because it was only a short period of time in the Formula One, the time runs away. Yeah? And then uh, we went to Spa, and um, he felt well in the car, everything was fine, he knew the team, he knew his engineer, and then he scored immediately points. From then onwards, it uh, went better and better. What happened with Yuki last year was a fantastic example for a rookie. You know, we did some private tests, Minimula, Misano, just that he gets familiar with the car. Then we had the test in Bahrain, which was a big advantage for the first race because he knew everything. And he got a fantastic result, the ninth place. But he was already on the limit. He was advising me a lot from the beginning of the season, like last year, like, you know, go step by step, you know, approach uh, step by step, take it easy first, you know, um, feel the car first, uh, you're a good driver, so, you know, you can perform well. But I was, first to be honest, not ignoring, but like I was not listening much to those advice because I had a, too much confidence. And then Yuki came to Imola. I know exactly what he thought. He didn't tell it to me, but he thought so. Now I need, I'm in Imola. We tested beforehand, and now I will show them my real performance. And then he simply overshot it uh, and crashed heavily. And after that, uh, after I lost the reason, lost confidence, I, you know, I deeply felt that I need a friend's advice. It's important to analyze what happened. And it's always individual different. You can't come up with a common or global schema and say, oh, you must do this, 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 because this driver did. No, you must talk to the driver, you must find out what helps him individually. And uh, for us, it was then clear to bring him to find as better, sit together with the engineers, have a daily schedule. And uh, I think this helped him a lot. They changed uh, the country from UK to Italy. I think it was a very good move to change my mentality or lifestyle. Because until when I was living in UK, is. It's like, um, yeah, it was really, compared to now, it just feel re really lazy. Our job as a team is to provide the driver with the best possible scenario, with the best possible infrastructure, to improve the performance and to get the best result out of it. But this is, for example, uh, that he is doing consequently the physical training, that he takes care for the nutrition, that he has meetings with the engineer, that after a race everything is being analyzed in the best possible way, and that the race weekend that uh, uh, we provide him with an environment that he can be focused 100% to the race and to get most out of him personally. We both have a common goal to push the team as far forward up the grid as possible and France has been always supporting that mentality and trying to help to develop myself but any other young drivers that he's worked with in the past and you know, when you talk about Sebastian Vettel, Max Verstappen, Daniel Ricciardo, Carlos uh, Sainz, all the other drivers that I'm not mentioning but that have been very successful in, in motorsports, they all came across 
friends and at some point benefited from his experience and his point of view as well to develop as a, as a race driver. Yeah, first of all, the Red Bull Junior drivers are skilled drivers and otherwise Dr. Marker would not take them into the junior program. But then of course it depends always how a driver develops himself in the following years. And it was a couple of times the case, not only with us, that the driver showed a fantastic performance in Formula 3 or in Formula 2, but in Formula 1 he couldn't improve. That means from his skills he reached the level and uh, he couldn't get better. There are other drivers, they improve, they learn year by year and that's decisive. With Max Verstappen it was a similar feeling. I observed him in Formula 3 and uh, I remember the race at the Norris Ring. It was wet there, it was raining heavily and he was at the track where the Formula 3 is doing around 57, 58 seconds. He was two seconds a lap faster than the rest of the field and uh, Max drove such a fantastic race and uh, therefore it was clear for me that he can come to Formula 1. And then, uh, you know, we did the first test here in Adria with him and then the first free practice one in Suzuka. I remember back when people said to us, you are totally crazy, Suzuka is one of the most difficult racetracks. You can't do this, yeah. but with Max it was not a problem. Why? Because we had the feeling that Max is not overloaded from the speed. He had everything under control and he was not passenger in the car, he was really driving the car. Therefore, I never had a doubt that bringing him, being 17 years old, even not having a driver license, into uh, Formula One. And uh, I remember in those days, uh, journalists coming to me, criticizing, I said, hey, Jens, just be quiet, let's talk in five years. And then we will see, either you have right or we are right. Yeah? And uh, they didn't come after five years anymore, yeah. <laughs> Vettel was in those days a special situation because he came to us during the season. His first race was in Budapest. And I remember back at the beginning it was not so easy. He had some uh, crashes at, in the first lap, coming back with a damaged front wing or something like this. Yeah. And, uh, but he improved immediately and uh, he really went faster and faster with a good understanding from the car and uh, we had then a fantastic season, especially in the second season where he won in Monza was uh, of course the highlight. 2008 was a very special weekend because we were dominant from the beginning onwards. Sebastian Vettel did a fantastic job and he had been qualifying the fastest time, which means he was on pole position. That means we really were competitive at this weekend. And then the race, Sebastian controlled the race from the start to the chicken flag. To Kovalainen, 1.2 seconds behind you. Kovalainen, 1.2 seconds. Keep pushing, Sebastian, you're doing well. Balance when you can, balance when you can. This was really a, a fantastic performance, fantastic work from Sebastian, but as well from the team. Box, Sebastian, box. Because we had pit stops, everything worked really well. No mistake, nothing. The setup of the car was uh, fantastic and we could beat all of them. Blue flag! Blue flag! How is Kovalainen doing? How is Kovalainen doing? Hey, Kovalainen is 12.6 seconds behind you, lapping in 36.4. You have won the Italian Grand Prix. You have won the Italian Grand Prix. I'm proud of you. Bravissimo. Bravissimo. Impressionante. 
Grazie Seb, stai nella storia Seb, stai nella storia I don't know what to say I, I miss the world Grazie mille, grazie mille Gara, perfetto Thanks, wonderful race Great job Yes! Uh, Sebastian was so focused and concentrated and he was so passionate that I was convinced he will become successful. I didn't know in those days that uh, he will win uh, four times the Formula One World Champion title, yeah? but I was sure that he will win races and if everything comes good together, if he is at the right time in the right team, that he can also win the championship. The first cars were uh, Red Bull technology cars. We always had another engine, but uh, the chassis and the rest uh, was designed by Adrian Newey. And uh, this worked Real good, maybe too good, because in 2008 we won in Monza and it's usually in Formula 1 if you have success, your rivals say no, 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 we must change something and then they change the regulation and uh, from one day to the next uh, we had to design the so-called listed parts by ourselves, but we didn't have the infrastructure for this. And now, immediately, we should uh, become a constructor and do everything by ourselves. 2009 and 2010, we really were struggling. And these two years were quite difficult for us. This period was the most difficult one and the most challenging one. Uh, to get everything ready, but also to perform on a reasonable level. Produrre una vettura da Formula 1 è una cosa difficilissima. Si tratta di mettere assieme in pochissimo tempo competenze, tecnologie e, e soluzioni di altissimo livello. È un business molto competitivo. Il sforzo necessario per essere successivo in Formula 1 da um, tutti i coinvolti è massivo. Siamo una, una scuderia che è chiaro che deve avere la presunzione e l'obiettivo di poter fare tutto in totale autonomia. Il know-how deve essere interno, le, 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 dobbiamo sfruttare al massimo le tecnologie perché la Formula 1 è la ricerca esasperata del, del massimo che ci possa essere sul mercato. Devi esplorare nuove strategie di produzione, nuovi materiali per fare in modo che tu riesca ad andare sempre più forte avendo sempre comunque ben presente la qualità e la sicurezza dei piloti. Stefano e il gruppo sono fantastici, sono i ragazzi che realizzano che la manufattura delle parti and without that you won't keep the plan. You can have the best design in the world, but if you can't realize the parts in the time scales you want, to the budget that you want, and meeting the technical specifications, you'll know where. Il nostro cliente è la gara, nel senso che in un'azienda, tra parentesi, normale, quando si ha un ritardo si può provare a posticipare la consegna, magari pagare delle penali o quant'altro. Questo è qualcosa che nel nostro mestiere non ci è concesso, in quanto la gara non si può spostare. Quindi il pezzo deve essere consegnato per l'evento richiesto, deve andare in pista nei tempi richiesti. I'm a reliability engineer. I follow the car build since the first nut to the last one. So when there is an issue, when there is a problem, we are the first one called to understand what's going on and how to be sure that the car can get out of the garage as soon as possible and for sure how to be able to finish the race. In questo tipo di business il tempo è performance, quindi tutti noi comprimiamo le nostre fasi per cercare di portare nel minor tempo possibile la performance in vettura. Se uno sviluppo in un mondo automotive o industriale richiede mesi se non anni, qui si tratta di giorni o settimane. La prima fase è un confronto con l'ufficio tecnico. Eh, par parliamo del telaio, c'è un, un primo meeting eh, con l'ufficio tecnico e si definisce un attimo come devono essere le divisioni, le scomposizioni o se c'è qualche lavorazione particolare, quindi dopo l'ufficio tecnico ha tutte le informazioni per poter rilasciare la geometria, rilascia la geometria, 
produzione prepara un block up, tavole di resina, che vengono tagliate, incollate, sagomate, che sono praticamente lo scheletro di quello che poi sarà il modello finale. Quindi dopo questo block up viene portato alla macchina utensile, il reparto CAD CAM fa un percorso, la macchina utensile lo lavora, viene tirato fuori il modello dal block up di tooling block. Nel caso del telaio è proprio il telaio finito, fine a se stesso. Dopo c'è una fase di preparazione per il reparto compositing che dovrà realizzare lo stampo e andrà a realizzare il negativo del telaio. Sul negativo del telaio, sempre il reparto composite, dopo la preparazione, comincerà a laminare X pelli, pelli di, di carbonio, più tutto quello che serve appunto per creare la struttura del componente in carbonio. Dopodiché viene fatto un sacco, viene messo sotto vuoto, viene tolta tutta quanta l'aria per cui si fa in modo che le pelli aderiscono perfettamente sul, sullo stampo e viene portato in autoclave. Autoclave, a seconda del materiale, un ciclo di cottura, eh, a temperatura, sotto vuoto, eccetera, eccetera. Dopo il ciclo, finito il ciclo di cottura, viene estratto dall'autoclave, viene estratto dal sacco. Nel caso del telaio ci sono delle fasi di lavorazione meccaniche che vengono fatte lasciando il componente all'interno dello stampo. Su un particolare che magari non, non deve avere, non ci devono essere delle lavorazioni meccaniche, viene estratto dallo stampo e io ho il mio pezzo finito. A Formula One car is made up of around 24,000 parts. Scuderia Alfa Tauri designs and builds most of its car in-house, with the exception of the engine. The most commonly used material is carbon fiber, with the whole car weighing less than 800 kilograms, with the driver on board. The current Formula One cars are powered by what is known as a hybrid power unit, consisting of a 1600cc V6 turbocharged internal combustion engine, which puts out around 775 horsepower, with a further 165 horsepower coming from the battery that stores energy by recovering it from the brakes and exhaust system. Una macchina di Formula 1 è composta in termini volumetrici per il 70% di carbonio e il 30% di metallo. La struttura della macchina è la seguente, c'è una struttura di crash anteriore, poi c'è lo chassis, quindi la, la cellula di sopravvivenza del pilota, poi c'è il motore, il cambio e la struttura di crash posteriore. Questa è l'ossatura della vettura. Attorno a questa viene costruite tutti gli impianti, quindi idraulici e elettrici, e poi tutta la parte di carrozzeria. La fase di vernissatura è importante tanto quanto tutto il resto della vettura, perché è quello che tutti vedono e che tutti si ricordano. E questo vuol dire che ad ogni Gran Premio bisogna presentarsi in griglia con la macchina perfetta. Diciamo che eh, l'idea creativa ci arriva comunque dall'Austria, in particolare da Alfa Tauri, sono loro che creano eh, la livrea vera e propria. Noi riceviamo un'immagine 2D e sulla base di questa eh, poi eh, procediamo a, a adattarla alla vettura vera e propria. E la procedura è eh, piuttosto complessa. Noi iniziamo con eh, col proiettare la livrea sulla vettura stessa, quello che viene chiamato il mock-up, quindi diciamo così un modello della vettura che riproduce inizialmente la scocca, eh, quello che viene chiamato engine cover o cupola in italiano e le pance, sulle quali noi proiettiamo proprio con, con, fisicamente con un proiettore la livrea. In questo modo riusciamo a fare adattamento in tempo reale e ad ottenere eh, la rispondenza quanto più precisa possibile rispetto all'input che abbiamo ricevuto dall'Austria. Una volta che eh, questo risultato è stato ottenuto eh, passiamo a eh, rilevare manualmente tutte ehm, le superfici, tutte le sagome della livrea stessa, dopodiché fotografiamo queste sagome per poterle poi trasformare in una grafica vettoriale che ci permette di tagliare a plotter le maschere di verniciatura che poi utilizziamo per tutti i componenti che arriveranno, che sono ovviamente tutti quanti uguali tra, tra di loro, il che è molto importante soprattutto durante l'inverno quando i pezzi nuovi arrivano, spesso arrivano anche all'ultimo momento e devono essere lavorati molto molto in fretta per poter riuscire ad andare al primo test oppure alla prima gara e, e, e quant'altro. Quindi diciamo che è un'operazione ehm, che sfrutta la tecnologia sicuramente, ma dove c'è anche una componente artigianale molto molto importante, perché è chiaro che serve esperienza, serve occhio per ottenere la grafica corretta, ma poi ci vuole anche tantissima precisione, tantissima pazienza per poter rilevare manualmente tutte quante le forme della vettura. La vettura 
può magari non sembrare così guardando la televisione, ma è lunga più di 5 metri e mezzo e, e quindi la superficie da, da coprire, da decorare è tanta. Per cui si tratta di un lavoro sicuramente, sicuramente impegnativo che richiede anche tempi abbastanza lunghi per poter essere svolto in maniera, in maniera ottimale. Quindi in questo senso l'esperienza di, di, di chi opera eh, in questo reparto è fondamentale perché non è sicuramente un qualcosa che si può improvvisare o fare in maniera approssimativa. Nell'era Toro Rosso, scuderia Toro Rosso, la, la livrea tradizionalmente è sempre stata piuttosto aggressiva. Prima con il Toro, poi anche nel triennio in cui abbiamo avuto la livrea diciamo, blu elettrico e rosso fluo, che tra l'altro ha scosso un grandissimo successo eh, anche da parte degli appassionati e non solo dei nostri tifosi, ma da, da tutti gli appassionati di Formula 1, comunque era un'immagine molto forte, molto eh, di, di impatto, che mirava a sorprendere ed era anche fortemente riconoscibile. I primi anni, parliamo del 2006, 2007, 2008, eh, la vettura veniva ancora adesivata, il che non era sicuramente semplice perché il Toro di, di Pirkner ricopriva buona parte la vettura e per essere realizzato dovevamo fare una sorta di collage con ben 53 adesivi diversi che dovevano combaciare perfettamente tra di loro per ottenere eh, il risultato desiderato. Questo chiaramente comportava dei tempi di lavorazione estremamente lunghi che in periodi di emergenza rappresentavano sinceramente un, un grosso problema. Questo è stato uno dei motivi, anche se non l'unico, non il principale, per cui abbiamo deciso poi a partire già dal 2009 a verniciare in realtà la vettura. Questo perché riusciamo a eh, ottenere una lavorazione standardizzata, molto più precisa, con anche degli effetti estetici eh, più, più curati, più efficaci, il che è molto importante, ma soprattutto in questo modo abbiamo dei benefici sia a livello di aerodinamica che a livello di peso. Siamo riusciti a risparmiare quasi 2 kg eh, passando dalla verniciatura al sistema tradizionale di vernici più adesivi, che è un risultato mm, abbastanza eh, importante e significativo. Formula One is a global sport, representing major motor manufacturers as well as other brands, who use the sport as a marketing platform for themselves and for their sponsors at a global level. So, good evening everybody and welcome here to Hangar 7 in Salzburg, Austria. On the 14th of February 2020, the new livery of the Honda-powered AT01 was unveiled in an amazing event at Red Bull's Hangar 7 in Salzburg. It's a fresh start, it's a fresh impetus, it's a, another name on the grid, it's another look on the grid. It was love at first sight, with the AT01 a technological sculpture, dressed up in high fashion, a work of art on four wheels merged with the beauty of speed. Fans from around the world voted it the best-looking Formula One car that year. Alfa Tauri's stylish arrival at the team did not just mean a change of color. It was also a change of image. With a rebranding of the whole company, from the factory to the race suits worn by our drivers, who back then were Daniel Kvyat and Pierre Gasly. You know, the team progressed a lot in the last years, but not only in one area. It must be in all the areas, and uh, I'm really looking to this, that we improve everywhere. It starts with the aerodynamic department, on the aerodynamic side. We are also much better on the concept side, and also the design office is understanding now Formula One better as it was in the past tense. They are much more involved, the designers, in all the processes. And uh, in production, we also made a big step forward, not only to produce the parts, but especially from the quality side. Quality control, which is very important. We improved there a lot. We brought in new people, which helped. And uh, at the racetrack, the vehicle performance group has also improved. 95% of, of the car performance comes from its design, uh, its quality and the components it has. The power unit, the tires. In vehicle performance, we look at optimizing the last 5%. And the last 5% is very, very, very difficult to, to achieve because it's about 
making the car fit the driver, understanding what the driver needs to, to go fast, uh, adapting to uh, variable conditions. We try to be data-driven. So it means that we, we analyze the data, we do simulations to try to estimate what will be the behavior of the car with the driver in, in real life. But all these data and all those simulations, they are uh, approximations of real life. They are not exactly what's happening. So there is a part of uh, interpretation from the engineers, from the data they have. It's not really a gambling, it's more a guessing what's really happening and what is the mechanism that will make the car faster. There is no easy decision in a, in a race weekend. We define what will be the optimum aerodynamic configuration, what is the optimum rear wing, where at which temperature we should be operating the tires, or how much we inflate the tires, uh, what are the suspension settings, and none of these decisions is, is an easy one. Because none of us knows exactly what is the perfect answer. I'm not the one uh, knowing how to make the car faster every time, every day, in every track. The group is. So we, as a group, we work on uh, various aspects of the car. We propose the data, we make some guess, and then we make a number of decisions. And the race engineer is the final one that makes the call and says, OK, that's going to be the race car. That's going to be the configuration of the car tomorrow. And uh, we will go racing with this car. Basically, um, the strategist is mainly responsible for um, the qualifying plans and of course for the strategy um, for the race, for both cars, so for both drivers. And in parallel to that, we are also responsible for the uh, competitor analysis to analyze how strong, how weak we are compared to our main competitor. Sicuramente i piloti, eh, i piloti sono un aspetto fondamentale. È fondamentale ascoltarli, capire che sensazioni avvertono guidando la vettura, perché ogni pilota è diverso, e ogni pilota cerca di trasmetterti quello che capisce dalla vettura. Poi il ballon con 17. Il ballon è molto buono, è molto più stabile. Qualcosa di strano nel mid corner. Si va a questo. Sono i sensori più importanti che abbiamo in vettura. La percezione, quello che loro sentono, quello che la vettura li trasmette è fondamentale. Ottimizzare solamente la vettura non ci porterà ad avere una macchina veloce. Bisogna sempre considerare quello che loro avvertono. Loro devono capire cosa succede e questo è uno degli aspetti più complicati. Often uh, people underestimate how much performance there is in the capacity for the driver to feel comfortable in the car and to be able to, to push it to, to the limit. In my role, I need to make sure that the driver can perceive that this group of engineers I lead is there to help, is there to make the car faster and, and is there for, for them. We will do whatever it takes to make them more comfortable with the car. We will change the car, we will modify some components, we will develop new uh, front suspension, uh, we, will, we, we, will, we will do what it takes to make sure that uh, we don't let uh, any stone unturned and they feel we are here and, and we, will, we, will, uh, we will optimize everything for, for them. We are really growing. We do the work of quality and quantity now e soprattutto la consapevolezza. Tecnicamente ormai abbiamo quella consapevolezza, facciamo scelte tecniche anche un po' più spinte, più azzardate. Ovviamente abbiamo vissuto in 15 anni alti e bassi. I remember very well Monza 2008. I was control engineer on Sebastian Bourdes car. I worked together with Claudio Balestri. He was the race engineer and after a very strong qualifying on Saturday, we we qualified fourth. And the other car with Sebastian Vettel was on pole. Eravamo stati molto competitivi tutto il weekend. Io sempre da appassionato di Formula 1, nato a Monza, 
mi ritrovo a Monza nelle prime file, era comunque un momento eh, veramente strano per me. Mi trovavo con il pilota che seguivo, Sebastian Baudet, in seconda fila, quarto, con delle probabilità molto alte di finire a podio. It was a rainy day and the race would start behind safety car, so we wouldn't do the standard race procedure. And uh, together with the other car, we control engineers to the decision to uh, change our procedure to, to have a, a safer uh, getaway behind the safety car to start the race. In quei momenti abbastanza frenetici eh, è partito un discorso eh, fra il sottoscritto e Guillaume, che all'epoca era il mio conto ingegnere, e volevamo fare una partenza che noi chiamiamo un garage exit, quindi senza seguire le procedure classiche. Unfortunately, uh, the driver did something which was a bit of a half of the standard procedure and half of something else and the combination of our new settings and all this made that the, the car stalled on the grid. The engine stopped at the race start. So our car was stopped on the grid. Everybody was leaving and the group of marshals that were there had to push our car in the pit lane to clear up the, the grid for the race start. Abbiamo spinto la macchina in, uh, in pit lane e non avevamo il tool per riportare la macchina in condizioni operative e quindi, e quindi in quei minuti lì le altre macchine avevano già completato il primo giro e in due minuti avevamo stallato la macchina ed eravamo un lap, one lap down, eravamo doppiati. But our car was in first gear with the engine off, stall, so it was stuck in gear and it couldn't move. So uh, the marshal pressed the emergency neutral boot button, which is the, 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 the button, the system that disengages the gear, uh, the clutch from uh, uh, the engine from the wheels and uh, allows us to push the car on the pit lane. And we did uh, restart the engine. Unfortunately, the, the emergency system uh, was uh, engaged and to rearm the system, we were missing uh, a, 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 small, a small device to try to, to, reset, to reset the emergency system. Abbiamo chiesto a un commissario di darci qualcosa e ci ha dato un mazzo di chiavi di uno scooter. Abbiamo, abbiamo, abbiamo riacceso la vettura, ringaggiando la frizione e siamo partiti. Unfortunately, those keys were on the driver's legs in the cockpit. They, they were dropped in the cockpit. So, Seb uh, started the race behind the pack. He was late, trying to catch up the pack, and breaking for turn one, he found his keys on his knees. He could feel there was something moving. So he grabbed the keys and <laughs> threw them away on the gravel in turn one in Monza. At the end of the race, the poor marshal showed up asking for his keys. <laughs> and nobody could figure out where the keys were. And actually the driver remembered said, ah yeah, yeah, I remember your keys. They are in turn one in the gravel. <laughs> so the car went there and I finally got, got the keys <laughs> after two hours of racing. It was, it was a very special day. In 2023, just 10 teams compete in motor racing's top category. Most of them are based in England with others in the USA, France and Switzerland. And then there are two in the same Emilia-Romagna region of Italy. In the diverse world of Formula One, Scuderia Alfa Tauri boasts a particularly rich DNA, made up of Italian passion, Austrian efficiency and British pragmatism. We have 35 different countries here or people from these countries and um, it's good to see although they are coming from completely different cultures that they can work together that uh, they build up a good business relationship and uh, which shows to me doesn't matter from which culture you are coming uh, how is your approach or whatever if you have a certain goal and if you have a certain target 
uh, you can work together with anyone and uh, that's interesting to observe. The process we follow each year to develop a car um, or design a car, develop a car, and operate a car, uh, you know, on paper are, are broadly similar. But we're always challenging ourselves, new processes, new ways of working, bringing more resource to the project, moving resource around. So no two years are the same. You know, you learn as you go along through one car development cycle and have ideas how you want to change that for developing the following year's car. Um, and then, so you're constantly evolving the technologies you use, the processes you use, and how much resource you put in each area. So you're following the same path, but you're looking to be better in every area, you know, year on year, development on development. Il race team è composto da diversi gruppi, il primo gruppo che è quello che arriva in pista per primo e poi va solitamente via per ultimo è quello dei tecnici del, del garage con il montaggio e poi successivamente lo smontaggio del garage e di tutte quante le sue attrezzature, si comincia all'incirca una settimana prima l'evento, tutto quanto il garage deve essere pronto solitamente eh, entro il, il martedì, eh, dal mercoledì arrivano i meccanici che mh, cominceranno a lavorare sulle, sulle vetture, il giovedì solitamente c'è l'arrivo degli ingegneri, eh, del marketing, della comunicazione e sostanzialmente quel giorno viene utilizzato come giorno di setup. La logistica è una logistica efficiente in Formula 1 è essenziale. Diciamo che noi abbiamo bisogno ormai con un campionato così complesso di eh, sei kit di garage eh, che viaggiano in, eh, intorno al mondo ovviamente per eh, tutte quante le attrezzature che possono essere replicabili e ripetibili ad un costo eh, accettabile quando invece si tratta di eh, alcuni pezzi che non possono essere facilmente replicabili, allora ovviamente eh, si adotta un eh, trasporto via aereo. Ad esempio, eh, la cosa più semplice che mi viene in mente sono le vetture. Ovviamente eh, poi c'è il trasporto su gomma, principalmente per, per le gare europee, quindi c'è tutto questo intreccio di logistica, unendolo poi ai programmi eh, di arrivo e partenza delle persone, che rende il tutto eh, decisamente complicato, ma allo stesso tempo decisamente stimolante. As teams have got bigger, there's more people involved in the process of trying to be as successful as possible, you know, and uh, the, the car racing on a Sunday, seen on TV, um, it's now, you know, the, the product of, in the smallest team, probably 400 people, in the larger team, probably 800 people. That's a huge amount of people and everyone's got a part to play in that and, and uh, they're emotionally attached to their part of the process. They want to do well, they want to do the best they can, but then on top of that, you know, they don't want to let their colleagues down. You know, in a football team, you've got 11 players on the pitch at any moment. Here, you've got 40 people traveling, but in the background, you know, there's four or 500 others who played a part in that and continue to play a part. So it's a massive team and these teams are getting bigger and bigger. So there is this emotional attachment and uh, I think everyone's really focused on doing the most. If, if you just wanted to come to work and do the same thing every day and work the minimum required hours, this is not the business. So I think everyone has an attachment to the sport who's involved in the teams. And on a Sunday, when we're racing, it, it all comes out really, and, and, and that's the pinnacle of what we're doing, and we get to see how good or otherwise we've been, and everyone's a big part of that. This rule change for 2022 was not only a big challenge for Scuderia Alfa Tauri, but for the whole Formula One and for all the Formula One teams. Regarding now Scuderia Alfa Tauri, we started quite early with this project, already two years ago, with the concept group. But of course, last year, especially from June onwards, all the engineers were concentrated on the development and on the design of this new car. As an engineering exercise, it was the, one of the, if not the biggest regulation change ever seen, or seen in recent times in Formula One. I mean, the key aerodynamic change with these regulations um, is 
that the cars are easier to follow each other and it's easier to overtake. Formula One and the FIA want to promote overtaking, they want to make the races closer and more exciting. And the key aerodynamic feature that they're promoting there by controlling in some ways how you must develop the car is that, um, that they want that the following car, so the car behind the lead car, loses less downforce when it's following the old regulations. The car behind would lose an awful lot of downforce, it would slide around more, the tyres would overheat, the driver would find it hard to overtake. Now, the following car maintains more of its downforce, so it's able to run for longer, closer behind the car ahead. Its tyres are in a better condition, and then it's able to make an overtake. So that's the, the basic philosophy. The floor is the key battleground to developing the car at the moment, I would say. Formula One is the fastest and most complicated race car that exists. We are designing, uh, producing and, and optimizing those, those cars. It's a worldwide championship. We fight against big teams, big brands, very talented drivers. And our job is to try to, uh, to build the fastest car and try to um, score as many points as we can around the, the season. I think it's fair to say that the development of this car led us to have the busiest winter ever. I mean, for design, production, the aero guys, everybody. It's been an incredibly busy period. I was really nervous. Uh, I hardly remember back uh, to have such tough months uh, as this year. Everything was much more expensive than the years before. It's a new car. And then I just thought by myself, how, how we can manage all this? Yeah? I was wondering if, if it's a good car, you know, like kind of uh, what how, how the car behaves. Also, yeah, how can I adapt to the new 18-inch tires? You know, we want to put a lot of effort um, to achieve similar results or, you know, or be better result than the previous years. As simplistic as it may seem, you start with an idea. I mean, it, it, it's, it's an idea. You have a set of regulations, the things that you're permitted to do, the outline of what the FIA want the car to be. And then you read those regulations and you say to yourself, okay, what's it telling me? What's it not telling me? All the engineers here, the first thing we do is we go through all the rules in as much detail as we can. And our first thought is, where can we find the areas where we're going to put the most performance onto the race car? Whether that be within the rules that have been given to us or maximizing the boundaries of those rules. In Formula One, every team principle pushes very hard to get all the advantages for his team. But of course, there are nine other teams as well. One of the hardest things was trying to make sure we didn't go in a direction which was meant the car didn't have any development potential in it and we'd have to start again for the subsequent year. So overall that was probably my biggest concern in the concept stage of the car development. There were always some small changes but um, the big concept was uh, quite clear. But, you know, in Formula One you want to stay as long as possible in the wind tunnel because every day you are more investigating on the aero side, as more you can improve your performance. The regulation change introduced for 2022, like any major regulation change, brings uh, a risk and a potential reward. You know, we look at our situation in 2021, our car was developing fantastically well. You know, we were finding huge lap time gains through the season. But in the background, the new regulations are coming, so you have to decide how to split resources. Um, but every team has to make that decision. A further variable in our case was the fact we were changing wind tunnel facility, which meant we had to migrate from our old facility to our new one. And you can only use one wind tunnel at a time, so you have to be quite clear in your decision-making process there. So that was an added variable. But as an engineer, the opportunity to design a car to a new regulation is fantastic. The aero testing process is fundamental to the whole process of the development of the racing car. For a new racing car, it starts very early on. As soon as we have an idea of the rules, um, we set about trying to understand 
how the rules are written and what that actually allows you to do in reality. So we, we read the rules very carefully. Um, people start drawing things in CAD, coming up with ideas of what the car might look like just based on those rules. And as soon as we have a, a car shape together that fits the rules, then we immediately start simulating and testing things computationally at first. So we run some computational fluid dynamics simulations to give us an idea of how that first car, which fits the framework of the rules, performs. The consistent challenge is that aerodynamics is very complex. So when we have an issue or if something looks unexpected or strange, we'd have to then go back and find what the input into this very complex system is that has changed that result and that given us this strange result. So trying to relate those inputs is the challenge of finding that input and distilling the thousands of data channels that we look at into something very simple um, and then validating a, a hypothesis that you've come up with and then obviously resolving that issue. We first put ATO3 into the wind tunnel in about March 2021. Um, it's a little bit later than ideally we would have wanted to um, for a number of reasons. The main one being that as a department, we also had the additional challenge of changing from a 50% scale model to a 60% scale model um, at around the same period. The ATO3 rules were actually delayed by a year due to COVID. Um, so it was never in our plan to have to deal with a new set of aero regulations at the same time as a change in wind tunnel. It was a, a big change and a, a new project um, for us, very different to previous, because it was the first model for us which was solely in the 60% wind tunnel. A wind tunnel is a, a piece of apparatus that we use within the aerodynamics department to measure the aerodynamic performance of the racing car. So we have a scale model of a car which we are able to measure the forces seen on that car when we blow wind over the car. So it's a simulation of a racing car in an environment that we can control very precisely. The most important part is the test section. Um, where the, the model sits and that's where you're, you're taking all your measurements but kind of following the air around so it'll pass the, the test section, go around through uh, some turning vanes and come to the fan. The fan is obviously propelling that air and giving it its velocity, its speed around the, the circular loop um, and then you're, you're finally contracting the, the air down into a jet so that's how it appears in front of the model is you contract in a, a controlled flow uh, of a known turbulence and, and quality in front of the model and it just goes around and around. So that's driven by the, the next most important thing, the control room. A wind tunnel produces all sorts of different data that we can analyse. Um, we can look at the forces that are generated on the model by essentially weighing the model and weighing it when the wind is blowing over it. We get lots of data from pressure measurements on the surface of the components, so on the floor, underneath the wings, we have lots of what we call pressure tappings, so we get a really detailed surface measurement of pressures. We can also do more direct measurements of the airflow in the wind tunnel using uh, systems like PIV, which is a laser-based system that we can use to track how the air molecules move and it gives us a really clear insight into the behaviour of the flow around the car as well as the flow on the car itself. Probably the, one of the most challenging things about tackling and designing the ATO3 development project was simply the fact that it was such a significant change in the style of car that the rules made you create. So we went from a car with a fundamentally flat floor into one which had a completely three-dimensional shape to the underfloor and it forced us into a total redesign of the wind tunnel model and how that was built. We no longer had a flat metal floor that we would bolt components to. We now have a, a fully sculptured 3D floor which changes all the time. It never it never stays still, it's not the same dictated by the regulations throughout the whole season. So we are now in a situation where we have to create more components, bigger components to test these bigger changes and the floor development is one of the, uh, one of the key areas for development that we're seeing under these regulations. 
correlation is a, a massively important part of the entire process. The understanding that say, the wind tunnel um, or the physics in the wind tunnel differ slightly to the racetrack is quite an important um, and key area. We get feedback from the drivers all the time. For example, when we bring upgrades to the track, we will test them in CFD and in the wind tunnel first, so we'll have an idea of what they are doing. But what's important is how they perform on the track at the end of the day. That's where correlation is important, because essentially one of the things that affects the lap time the most is the feeling the driver has. So if we can provide uh, the driver with a car that he can drive quicker, um, that he can operate in the way that he likes, that will essentially make us quicker. In 2020, it was a dry race. So on, on dry race, you can only win if you have one of the fastest cars. Obviously, we had a little bit of luck because by the race circumstances, we, we ended up at the front. There was the race interruption with the red flag. Red flag, red flag, red flag. Oh, this can't be true. Who pitted in front of us? Only Hamilton, but the pit end was closed, so he should have a penalty. Then the penalty for Hamilton. Hamilton will get a penalty. Hamilton will have a penalty. And after the restart, Pierre uh, got immediately into the lead. Push now, push now. Half of the race, uh, we were the leading car and uh, people behind couldn't, couldn't attack us. If you don't belong to this part of the game, in Formula 1, you don't stay there for long. Uh, you get overtaken by, by someone faster. The car behind is charging the battery to prepare to attack. We can defend. Carlos, who was his main competitor at the end, was a little bit holed up. In the first uh, laps of the restart, that this helped uh, Pierre uh, to keep the lead and to win this race. Science is 3.4 behind, 3.4 behind, around the 10th faster at the moment. We're doing a good job. How is the rear slip? It's good, it's good. Last lap, one more lap. Oh my god! What did you do? What did you do? Did you the fucking You Oh my god! It was a, a race we we deserved. We deserved the steam, the driver, uh, the car performance. We had everything and nobody could really uh, take it from us. I just want to say congrats to all of you. All of you. Did an amazing job. Alpha Tari, Honda, all the engineers, all the mechanics, everybody in Fanza. Thanks to you, we, we did it! We did it! Yeah! Thank you, mate. Amazing race. You did an amazing job. They did a fantastic job from the driving side, I must say, because our car was fast, was good, but not as good as, uh, for example, the McLaren in those days. Yeah? And therefore, it was really a big, big victory for Pierre, but of course also for the team, yeah? because the car was prepared very good. It was, it was a dream in Monza. Winning in Formula One is the dream of any child who dreams about motorsports, who dreams about being a racing driver. And it's something that I've dreamt, you know, a thousand times when I was a, a kid. To experience it live in Italy with a, 
an Italian team was uh, incredible emotions and, and something I've never felt you know in my entire life the emotions I got that they were were just a uh, different different level. Once I started, my parents used to bring me to every single race. They used to stay awake till three in the morning to find sponsors, to find ways for me to pay for the seasons, to find solutions to do the next seasons with other teams. They were like managers, uh, sponsors. My dad was my mechanic. We were, we were doing like everything together. And you know, I'm the last one of a big family. I have four brothers and everybody had to make sacrifices to allow me to uh, pursue my dream. And uh, you know, I'm very grateful for that because I know 100% if I didn't have that support from all of them, if they didn't understand what it takes to be a Formula One driver, I'll never, I'll never be where I am today. Obviously, it's a lot of sacrifices from everyone. Um, you know, I've seen my parents going through extremely difficult times just because they, they literally gave everything they had for me to race only in karting. When I think about it, it's completely insane. They've taken like huge financial risk for the entire family just to give me the opportunity to follow my dream. Even it was very, very far away from Formula One. And um, I've always understood the efforts they've made and I've always told myself I'll do whatever it takes to make it to Formula One to thank them for everything that they've done for me. I do it for myself because I want to be Formula One world champion, don't get me wrong, but seeing all the efforts from everyone also gave me so much internal strength inside me to go beyond my limits because they've done everything they could to, um, for me to, to be in that position. And uh, yeah, no, I must say I'm really happy to look after them, look after the entire family and, and give them back for, for all the efforts they, they've done for me. To me, becoming a Formula 1 driver is also already a lot of things I, I sacrificed. It's a completely different life I did compared uh, you know, like, um, normal people. There's a good thing and lots of you know things I can, couldn't do, I couldn't experience. I think I sacrificed a lot more than um, I got in Formula 1 but I think in the end was a, for me it was a good, good decision uh, what, I, what I sacrificed in the previous years because that's why I'm here. Of course I'm ready to sacrifice more or you know to walk different lifestyle as a compared to other you know normal people to become Formula One champion. Come on, two more now, two more. Yeah. Push, push. Up, 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 up. Good. Up, 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 up. Yeah. First one and back. Push, 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 push. Yes, done, done. Oh, you got a bonus round. <laughs> of course sometimes I always wonder I would like to become you know, normal people to, you know, like, kind of do th those things or other things. But this is the life I choose, and I'm always sticked on it. And I'm really lucky, love it already. Love the racing, I uh, love Formula One. So I just stick on it, this one, and stick my life for this racing. Yeah. Formula One, obviously, is a high commitment job. We, we work a lot. Uh, we work during the race weekends. Uh, I travel at times at the racetrack. Uh, but I try to uh, protect a little bit my, uh, my family from, from this big activity. Actually, we don't talk much Formula One. For sure, we, we share the results of the qualifying, the race, and, and they ask me how how it went and, uh, and if we did a, a, a good weekend. Um, my son is, is a fan, he's a fan of uh, Scuderia Alfa Tauri, 
he likes the drivers and uh, and he's, he's following what's what's going on but I try to avoid uh, making Formula One being the, the the center of everything because it's already a big commitment uh, on, on my side this is a choice I made uh, I was a big fan of Formula One I wanted to be in, in this game but uh, I tried to find the right balance between uh, uh, be between this and, and my, my private life. When I joined the team, I or agreed to join the team, I remember saying to my wife, look, I'll, it's three years. Um, we had an opportunity to visit Italy, take school holidays in Italy. We can do 10, 12 weeks as a family together in Italy. We'd agreed that my wife and the kids would stay in the UK because they were settled at school. And it was going to be a three year adventure and then we'd see, and that, that might be the end of it. Uh, seven and a half years later, we're still, uh, we're still doing the same thing. And it's, it's been fantastic for the kids. You know, it's not great being away from home so much, but it's a nice life here. The weather's good, it's, the, the, the family like coming. We sort of make it work. Um, my wife and kids have always been used to me traveling and we make it work. But overall, it's been a good experience for the family really to experience Italy and different culture and meet new people. So I'd like to think that w w it's been good for everyone in some way, shape or form really. Welcome. I like this. I joined in 2017 the world of motorsports as a secretary general of the FIA um, following a call of Jean Todd who uh, uh, obviously was the president back then of the FIA. He was also the one uh, who allowed me then to become an executive director of Formula One. I remember Jean Todd always saying, uh, Peter, when you have a doubt, call Franz, Franz Tost, um, because he will give you an honest answer. La sua eredità è un'eredità molto importante. Devo dire che per me Franz è stato prima un capo, eh, poi è stato un mentore, poi è stato un maestro, poi è stato un modello e poi è diventato una sorta di fratello maggiore. E lui è stato sempre presente. Sai, è quel tipo di figura che sai che c'è e puoi sempre contare su, su di lui. Vedevo in lui una persona che non stava svolgendo un lavoro, vedevo una persona che stava portando avanti una missione che voleva fare in modo che Scuderia Alfa Tauri diventasse, come è diventata, un team di successo, un'azienda strutturata, capace di competere ai livelli più alti. Si chiude un, un capitolo per, per la squadra, ma in generale si chiude un capitolo uh, per tutta quanta la, la Formula 1, perché in generale la figura di Franz è una figura che può essere presa come esempio per uh, tantissimi altri uh, team e team principal uh, che si troveranno in una situazione simile, ovvero quella di cercare di far crescere uh, dei giovani piloti, cercare di aumentare le prestazioni di una piccola squadra e farla crescere per diventare una squadra sempre più grande e più importante. Together, Laurent Mechies and myself, we will uh, step into the big footsteps of Franz Tost, who, uh, you know, they are, they are big ones to fill, which is probably why they have chosen two people to fill uh, the steps. And um, Laurent Mechies will uh, focus very much on the racing side of, uh, uh, of the team, meaning the technical and sporting and racing team. He will go to all the races and be, you know, uh, um, be on site as a team principal. My role is a, a slightly different one, is a more strategic one, focusing on the business development, working together uh, with the shareholders in, uh, uh, in Austria, working together with uh, Red Bull Racing in, uh, in uh, the United Kingdom, making sure that all the synergies available are being uh, used within the legal framework, of course, the FIA regulations framework. The discussion currently is, is, is ongoing to, um, to establish a new identity for the team, a new brand identity for the team. We also want to position the team uh, uh, clearly next to our brother Red Bull Racing, we are working on, a, on, a, on names and proposals and designs which will clearly show again uh, our relation to Red Bull. So uh, you will see the bulls again uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a more prominent way and also in the name that will be, um, that will be expressed. Uh, we believe that we can uh, find ourselves with different values. We can be a younger team, we can be perhaps a bit more aggressive, more maverick, than Red Bull currently is, was a globally established brand today with huge sponsors. Oracle, uh, you know, is a very 
corporate firm and we believe that we have there is space on the paddock for a younger team that's more colorful, uh, that is following the philosophy of developing young drivers and, uh, uh, and that will be you know, perhaps a bit more Red Bull spirit uh, uh, than actually our older brother currently has. I think the, when I remember back how we started and uh, what happened in all the years with uh, building up uh, the infrastructure as I mentioned before and uh, the team itself reshuffling everything that uh, the team reached quite a good level but there is still potential uh, to go forward therefore I see uh, Scuderia Alfa Tauri in a good shape for the next years. Over the years, this team has experienced highs and lows, which is to be expected in any sport. It's been a journey undertaken by a workforce united by the same passion and the same goals that they put to the test year after year. In sport, a single win is often built on the back of many defeats, and Formula One is no exception to that rule. Winning a race, finishing on the podium, or scoring points, it's all the same. Nothing must go wrong. Back in the factory and at the track, everyone must give their best. Like the cogs in a watch, that all have to mesh together to work perfectly. A Formula One team is structured like a pyramid. At its base, many people in the various departments work on developing and building the car. Then a smaller number go to the racetrack to compete against the other teams. Well, finally, the driver alone gets behind the wheel, racing for the best possible result. And the next day, the whole process starts over again. But this is no boring routine, because every race, every season, delivers new excitement for those whose job it is and for the fans. Emotions are stories, like the one about this team. They are worth living to the full day after day, finish line after finish line. We've been doing this for many years now, and not just for what one feels at the end of the race, but especially for what one feels while racing. In racing, it's not just the finish line that matters, it's the racing itself, whatever it takes. <laughs> 